Are you planning on going to Japan this year? Well, I'm assuming you are because you clicked on this video. Well, if that's the case, then you're in luck because I just returned from a two week vacation there and there are definitely some things that I wish I would have known before going. So if you want to save yourself some time, money, and also just general frustration while you're traveling around the beautiful country, then I suggest you listen closely to this video because today I'm going to be sharing five things that I wish I would have known before going there and five things that you need to know before you go on your trip to Japan. details about our trip. We went there for a little bit over two weeks, um, around 17 days or so, and we went across the country. We did Tokyo, Kyoto, a village in the mountains in Nagano, and then went back to Tokyo. So as you can imagine, spending more than two weeks in a country on a vacation is quite a long time, and there are definitely some things that we've observed there that, um, let's just say, some content out there on the internet doesn't really mention. All right, without further ado, let's dive in. So the first thing that you notice is that there are quite a few things there that are genuinely quite overhyped. And this may be controversial just based on how popular this particular experience is, is staying in a traditional Japanese accommodation called a uh, ryokan. We've watched many videos advertising these places and like the whole etiquette of staying there and the way the kind of they were talking about it was just so like it, it like it was so cool and amazing when I think in reality you really have to pay close attention when you book and don't just book based on a hype like make sure that you check on the details because we stayed in a pretty nice hotel in Tokyo before going to Kyoto so when we arrived at our ryokan which was priced pretty much on par with our Tokyo hotel. We were so shocked. <laughs> we were so shocked. Not because, you know, the hotel wasn't clean or anything, but because our room was so tiny. Our room was like 100 square feet or 9 square meters. It was so shocking, particularly because we were paying more than 100 pounds a night. And it just felt like there was a huge mismatch from all the hype that it gets on the internet and the reality of it all. So these are the hotels that we stayed at in Japan. So the Gate Hotel was the one we stayed at in Tokyo and for four nights we paid 577 pounds. Let me show you what the rooms look like. So we stayed in a standard double room, non-smoking, and this is exactly what our room looked like. It was around 25 square meters so it's like a standard hotel room it had a very nice shower and bathroom and it had all the kind of amenities and also it had a rooftop so yes it's expensive but it's tokyo so it's kind of expected let's go and see how much we paid for our ryokan so we paid 521 pounds and let's see what the rooms look like there so very different vibe you see very moody and i guess these are the kind of pictures that i was going off of let me show you what the room actually looked like so um this i think was the room yeah so this is very similar to the type of room that we had you can see it's literally just this and somehow i thought maybe they just didn't i just didn't like kind of realize that there wasn't like an extra space that you saw in the previous picture. This room is 99 square feet. And you have to remember that, so this room had to fit all of our luggage, all of our kind of miscellaneous items and beds when they're rolled out because you have to set up the bed yourself. That's kind of part of the experience, which we didn't mind at all. And actually they were pretty comfortable. 
but the room was so tiny and those walls are so thin that it just didn't make for a great experience and, and I don't want anyone to think that we're bashing the hotel here, would never recommend staying in this particular one, that's not it at all. In fact, the staff were very helpful and very kind, it's just that we arrived at the conclusion that Ryokans are really not worth it, they're not really worth the hype and let's actually do a little study and see if this is the only Ryokan that is like this. So I'm searching for a holiday rental between 13th and 17th of June, which is kind of off season in Japan, which gives us more than a thousand hotels. And if we filter down to Ryokans, you can see there are only 31 results. So just based on the supply demand dynamics, you'll probably see inflated prices. So then you have this Ryokan, if you're booking a room, double room with a mountain view, a hundred square feet. Like why would you book something like that for close to 400 pounds? That doesn't make any sense. You can get yourself a capsule hotel with much better amenities. Then you have the Gion and you can see that this one is a lot more expensive and you're paying close to 700 quid for four nights. That's so expensive. Twin twin room with a bathroom. Let's click, let's look at that. Okay, so it's actually normal sized, but you can see how much more money you're paying for the setting that you get. Like these things are just overpriced based on how much demand they get. If you want to try it, by all means, go ahead and give it a go. But you're likely going to overpay for what you're getting. And you could be getting a better deal if you just go with a hostel or with a regular hotel. Just saying. I think in general that uh, getting a nice hotel when you're on vacation is very important. Whether it's expensive or whether it's just clean and quiet, you know, it doesn't really matter. As long as it feels like a nice space to return to. And after all of that time walking around exploring a place the last thing that you want is kind of returning to a space that you don't want to be in and that's definitely how we felt ryokans just based on the supply and demand dynamics they tend to be priced at a premium that isn't really justified by the product itself Takeaway number two, things are busy. So to absolutely nobody's surprise whatsoever, it's very busy in Japan. For one, because there was all of that pent up demand for the past two years that the country was closed. And also probably for us specifically because we went at the tail end of the Sakura blossoming season. That being said, I think the waiting lines that you experience in Japan, especially in Tokyo, which I find particularly surprising, are quite unacceptable, I would say. The reason I say that is because I visited Japan five years ago in 2018 in the summer and that had a lot of tourists. I remember there just being masses of people everywhere. However, there was never a time where I had to wait over an hour for a restaurant spot so consistently. So let me give you an example. Souffle pancakes. They were invented in Japan what better place to try them out than Japan itself? Well, if you've done your research, if you watch some videos, then you would probably come across a place called a happy pancake. Oh yeah, and just a quick one guys, if you're liking this video or if you're finding it useful, please drop me a like and consider subscribing. Liking the video really helps with discoverability and with small channels like mine, you're gonna be doing me a huge favor. So I really appreciate that and Let's go back to the main video. And it's a chain of like souffle pancake restaurants all around Tokyo. And I think the reason it's so popular is because it's very Instagrammable and the pancakes actually look very delicious. However, the one thing that people don't tell you is just how long the waiting line for these restaurants are. We've tried to go to a happy pancake twice. It opens at 10 a.m. You show up at 10, the wait line is two hours. That happened to us both times and I refuse to believe that we were just unlucky because we went on completely different days of the week. But uh, yeah, you can't really get a spot unless you book as, um, as I found out. 
and you'd probably roll your eyes at me right now like how did you not know that you could book well fun fact most of the restaurants are very hard to book because japan with all of its like technological advancement in the hardware world you know where you go from having <laughs> a uh, toilet with buttons to having all of these wonderful shinkansen trains is actually quite a bit on the back foot when it comes to application and software development in general first the websites honestly look like they were made in the 1990s and nobody ever bothered to update them and second they're all in japanese like for a place that gets such, so many tourists consistently over the years, you'd think that they would have English versions, but they don't, which is not a problem because obviously you have Google Translate. However, it becomes a problem when you think you can book a restaurant online because it gives you the link, but when you actually click on it, there is no actual calendar system for you to book that place because it tells you that you need to call the restaurant, which you can't do because A, you don't have the SIM, and B, you don't speak Japanese. But to get out of these kinds of situations, and this is the thing that I wish we'd done the most, is book everything in advance. So as much as you can, try to book online if it's possible. If it's not, and you're staying in a hotel, then it's worth asking the front desk staff if, if they can make a reservation for you. Because one thing that's amazing about Japan is just how polite and kind all of the people are there, or most of the people are there and they will definitely try their best to help you you know enjoy your stay while you're there so as a rule of thumb if you read about a place or saw a particular food spot in a video it's gonna be very full is not really much of a takeaway but kind of a PSA really and it has to do with the JR passes. If you've been doing your research then you've probably come across a thing called the JR pass which is essentially a railway pass that is entirely unlimited. So these passes can be amazing and I've used one back in 2018 which saved me a lot of money. However whether you need a JR pass or not is entirely dependent on the structure of your trip. So let's look at a sample itinerary that is quite realistic for your first trip to Japan, just hitting the main spots. And I'm on this website called jrpass.com where you can actually order JR Pass to your house. But I have this very nice feature of calculating JR fares for you. Of course, you can always use a Google Maps as well, which I have pulled up here. And as you can see here on the bottom, it has the cost which is very accurate but for the sake of convenience let's see the JR fair cal calculator and how much money it can save you so let's say you're starting from Tokyo and you are going to Kyoto over the seven-day itinerary then from Kyoto you're just hitting the local spots which are quite popular which are let's say Nara you can go feed your nice little deers. And I know that the plural of deer is deer, so don't at me. Then you may want to go to Kobe to try some really cool beef. Maybe you want to go to Osaka, which makes a lot of sense. And you're going back to Tokyo. So if we scroll down over this itinerary, you are saving at least 7,000 yen alone, which is really good. I mean, why wouldn't you want to save more money? Let's try to do a crazier itinerary where you're hitting a the major points of Tokyo, a samurai village in the north of the Honshu Island. Then you go to Kyoto and the local spots around Kyoto. So we're starting in Tokyo as always. And we then go to this place, Kakuno Date which admittedly is very far away you probably would do this itinerary over a two week period not one week but let's just see and then we're going to kyoto osaka let's say we go to nara and kobe and make it a round trip 
So a pretty crazy itinerary if you ask me. Anyway, you scroll down. Ta -da! You're saving 34,000 yen. And let's see whether let's let's do it, you know, over a more realistic time frame, which is a 14 days. Bam, you're saving 17,000 yen, which is crazy. But yeah, I hope this was helpful. Um, it's jrpass.com if you want to try it. It's quite useful and you can order your own JR Pass to your house. And of course, this is not sponsored because my channel isn't big enough to get any sponsorships just yet. Anyway, back to the main video. So takeaway number four actually nicely connects to what I was just talking about with train travel. And it's the fact that if you're planning to do a lot of train travel and if that involves connections. But I don't recommend following Google recommended timings for trains because Japanese railway stations are extremely confusing, especially the ones that you see in Tokyo. Shinjuku has to be the worst one I've ever been to just because of how confusing it is even with having English signage around. I think the reason for this is the fact that Japan and actually Tokyo public transportation system alone is operated by more than six, seven independent railway companies that are just not even connected together. There isn't actually a way to book a train ticket online in Japan. You have to go to the station and you have to use their booths, which are quite confusing and there will be times when you need to go to the desk to actually ask a person to help you. Typically, those desks have limited staff, so there will be a wait line. So the moral of the story is if you're traveling anywhere in Japan that involves a connection or you need to buy a ticket or any of those things, give yourself spare time, like up to 30, 40 minutes so that you can kind of figure everything out hassle-free and you don't feel scared that you're gonna miss your hundred dollar train actually the experience of using railway uh the railway system if you're not using the jr pass in japan has been probably one of the lowest points of the trip for us just because of how confusing it is and how little technology there is involved in it but you can't do anything about it you can just work with it so just make sure that you give yourself plenty of time and opportunity to ask for help where you, where you need it. Actually, just for a bit of trivia interest, let's have a look at just how many lines are servicing Tokyo alone. Okay, so let's have a look at all of the railway systems and lines within Tokyo. So this table details them all. And as you can see, there is one, two, three, four, five, six, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and more. So as a result, it's not really surprising that many stations are disjointed and don't really have a passageway one to the other. There's obviously a chance that there will be a time where you'll be really confused because you'll have to change from one line to another and they're not even in the same building. They're actually a five minute walk away from each other. And the reason is, is because they're operated by two different companies that don't talk to each other. And that's also evident in kind of the type of carriages that you get, just how clean they are and how frequently they're used. So it's really interesting that this is the case and that there isn't, I guess, more of a push from the government to make these systems more unified, but a seamless transition from one line to another would be great. is not really a one kind of unified lesson or idea. It's more of just a collection of a few different pieces of advice and maybe more like a common sense things that you should think about. So I'm sure you've considered this already, but it's worth reiterating that if you're going to Japan, try not to overpack. I would probably go as far as underpacking because Japan actually hasn't experienced inflation for the past 10 
years at least, which means that things are quite cheap in Japan or they feel cheap compared to most of the prices that you see around here in the UK, in London. So this actually checks out when we look at the PPP, which is the purchasing power parity. It's one of my favorite concepts in economics, which if you don't know what it is, uh, is essentially saying if a basket of goods costs $100 in the US, how much is that same basket of goods going to cost in, say, the UK or in another country? And this also accounts for currency differences, currency exchange differences. So it gives you a one-to-one -one comparison um, of how expensive one country is compared to another. So if we look at um, a comparative price table of the OECD here, just to look at the monthly figures, we can compare the UK and Japan and actually see whether my statements are supported by data or not. So if we pick Japan here, here's the column for Japan against other countries. And if we scroll all the way down, here is the number for the UK. So what this number is saying is that the UK compared to Japan is 16% more expensive in the month of uh, March in 2023. So this is a pretty interesting table and I'm gonna link it down below in the description box so you guys can check it out for yourself. It's quite fun to look at actually. Anyway, back to the main video. Plus you can do tax-free shopping around there so you already get a 10% discount. So you probably are gonna wanna buy a lot of different things, whether it's a yukata, whether you wanna go to Uniqlo, by the way, I got this in Tokyo. And there are actually, I think, 1,500 yen there, which is around, I want to say, like, 9 pounds. And I think they're definitely more expensive in the London store. Plus, you get a discount also. I mean, it's great. Uh, shopping in Japan is amazing. You, you would want to bring a lot of stuff. So just save yourself some room in the suitcase. And as I mentioned tax-free shopping just now, make sure that you carry your passport around with you because that's what's required to get that tax-free discount. You probably don't want to forget it in your hotel. So have it on you at all times, just because it will make your life easier. And I would also recommend carrying cash or at least your card on you, just because contactless payments are not really that widespread. And even if they are available, sometimes foreign cards don't work. So we were using our Monza card, for instance, and um, it only really worked in convenience stores and nowhere else. Speaking of convenience stores, if you don't have cash on you, they are everywhere and they have ATMs that allow free cash withdrawal. Amazingly, <laughs> Japanese banks don't charge you for using their ATMs and withdrawing any cash. And of course, always withdraw in local currency so that you get the best exchange rate. And last but not least, bring your most comfortable sneakers with you. Yes, this sounds like common sense, but you're gonna be doing a lot of walking and it's worth reminding you. I bought a new pair of shoes right before going and they were amazing. And the one half day that I didn't wear them, I really regretted that and went back to the hotel to change into them. But yeah, I hope that you found this video insightful and that you'll feel like it was worth watching while you're in Japan. And honestly, just get excited for your trip and Try not to contain that excitement too much because Japan is truly one of the few places in the world that it's worth feeling that for. But until then, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye!